Let's give him another hand of uh, applause and appreciation. It was really great to have, um, now I usually go to see the Kalama brothers at Ivalee's. You know, it's what a treat to have them right here in our community. And not only the Kalama brothers, but the, I love it. I'm going to call you Mama Kalama from now on. <laughs> it's totally going to stick, Jamie. Mm. So for those of you who may not know me, my name is Alice Reed, and I'm the spiritual leader here at Center for Spiritual Living Capistrano Valley. And if you haven't gotten a proper welcome yet, let me welcome you as well. But I think you have been welcomed appropriately by the music and the spiritual practice. And now it's time for me to share a little bit about what we're about um, and talk about the teaching and the philosophy. We are, we are uh, I like to refer to us as an interspiritual philosophy. And the reason... I think of it as interspiritual is while we, we do have a sacred text that we draw from, we draw from the teaching of a man by the name of Ernest Holmes, but we also draw from all the sacred texts. The Bible has much wisdom to give us. There, there's wisdom in the Tao Te Ching. There's wisdom in the uh, Bhagavad Gita. Um, Bhagavad Gita. I always miss a syllable in there. <laughs> I have a feeling I'm not alone. <laughs> um, and this year we have this um, wonderful theme of living out loud. And this month we're looking at speaking truth to circumstances and, uh, or speaking truth to conditions as I've been thinking about it. And uh, we've been drawing from the Gita. We've been drawing from this this ancient text that is over 5,000 years old and steeped in Hinduism that is, uh, you know, has a lot of similarity, if you will, to of the other um, Eastern religions. And uh, so today's talk is standing on Shiva. And if you're not familiar with the Gita, now I don't profess to be an expert. On, you know, I feel like I'm a... Uh, know a little bit about all of them. What is that, master of none? So... <laughs> Um, but, but I am just loving this deep dive into the Hinduism and, and much of the, what the metaphoric um, and anecdotal stories can tell us. Now, the, the Bhagavad Gita is the story of a prince who doesn't know his self-worth, if you will, doesn't know his true identity as one with all. Um, he's referred to his name as Arjuna, and he's the protagonist in the story, and we, we, this, it's a 700-page text, so there's a lot of information there, and it's, you know, there's a lot of uh, challenges and uh, wars and battles that, that Arjuna goes through, and in that text, we, you know, Krishna, who is the the supreme understanding of all life, Krishna, or we would refer to as God, um, is, is holding his hand, if you will. He's bringing him along. He's, he disguises himself as a chariot driver, and he is helping Arjuna to wake up. And in and amongst all the uh, Hindu traditions are these gods and goddesses that uh, are available to, to represent different aspects of the world and the life as we move through it. And so uh, Shiva, getting to it, <laughs> Shiva is actually the um, destroyer of illusion. The destroyer of illusion. And so the, there's a little story about a battle that's taking place between gods and demons. And, uh, and I would say if we were to bring this into the here and now, it would be that just like the battle we sometimes have for what we think is right and wrong, right? The gods and demons, right and wrong. And so the, in the story um, in the Gita, there's um, this battle going on and, and it feels like the, the demons are winning. So there is a call to one of the gods, Durga, known as the goddess of compassion and mothering, and they, they beg her to do something to alleviate this 
this uh, situation. And so out of her forehead springs this fierce warrior goddess, Kali. And Kali proceeds to destroy the demons, but she is so caught up with her mission that she's been called to support the, in this battle that she just begins to kill everything. She's destroying everything around her. And, and that is when Shiva, the destroyer of illusion, throws himself under her feet to help ground her, to bring her back to her purpose, to stop her rampage so that she can remember who she is. And so I love this metaphor in this story because in today's world, oftentimes we find ourselves at odds with what's happening around us. Maybe, it's, maybe your thing is climate change. Maybe your thing is racism. Maybe your thing is um, what's happening to uh, around the world in um, uh, child slavery or, or uh, the, you know, there's, there's a lot to be incensed about. There's a lot that, you, that we may want to go to war with, but when we find ourselves deep in, steeped in the conditions and the circumstances of the world, oftentimes we can get lost in the battle and we can forget the motivating factor that caused us to go to battle. We can forget that thing that drew us forward in our deep passion and interest for uh, the love that we have for the world. And when we get lost in conditions and circumstances, oftentimes we find ourselves reacting from the, the level of conditions versus the, the level of cause. And in Science of Mind, we talk about the our experience in life from a place of causes and conditions, very similar to Eastern religion that talks about karma and, um, and, and which is the same thing, causes and conditions, that, that there's, a, there's a, a higher understanding and then there's the experience that we have in the world. And so as we look at this idea of standing in Shiva, it's about grounding ourselves to principle. It's about grounding ourselves to the truth of life that is all around us. It's so easy to forget that we are made and we are the beautiful expression of the divine. That the divine so loved life that it gave us you. It gave us me. It gave us all the life that we experience around us. And when, when we get disconnected from that, that's when we need that Shiva energy to come back to ourselves, to come back to this truth and this principle of who we are. And, and to, you know, the, there's, it sounds dramatic, right? The destroyer of illusion. <laughs> but, but if you think about it, all creation moves through uh, creative forces that seem to destroy its container. If you think about the seed, right? It's a little shell of a something and it's got some kind of life force inside of it and we plant it in the ground. And it, only by destroying its container can life come forth in whatever plant comes through the soil. And so as the as looking at this Hinduism and the wisdom from that, we look at the idea of destroying, not of obliteration, but more of transformation. And and that transformation is happening all around us. And yet we human beings get pretty like, you know, we get comfortable <laughs> with the experience that we're having in the world of whatever that might be, the, the job that you're enjoying or the relationship you're enjoying or the the different conditions that, that we strive for in our human experience. But Shiva wants to remind us that there is something deeper, something that is a little, f uh, that takes a little more of a reach for us to leave our comfort zone, to touch that place of the divine that lives within us, that is giving life to all animation in life. I mean, I, I love when uh, I'm doing meditation, I'll often remind myself of the power of the breath. 
just seems like breathing, right? And I know there's some people who have diseases where breathing is difficult, but for the ma vast majority of us, you don't think about that with each breath, that breath has to nourish every cell and organ in your body, right? You know, we don't, we don't think about that, but it's a miracle of, of life is that with every breath, our body is nourished, and with every exhale, we let go of what we don't need, and we don't have to direct it, we don't have to orchestrate it, we don't have to plan it. We just breathe. And so when we remember that miracle of life, it gives us a sense of awe. I don't know about you, I'm in awe right now as I talk about that, that there's a, there's, a, there's a power and a presence to everything that we experience, and yet oftentimes we sort of ride the surface of our experience and forget about the awe, the thing that's beneath it all, the thing that animates all life. And in this philosophy and many other spiritual philosophies, the, the, um, the real tangible goal, the, the, out, the outcome, is for us to get in touch with that awe and in touch with that mystery that is present in all life. And so standing in Shiva is about standing true to who we really are and this experience we call life. Now, as I said, um, you know, in Science of Mind, we, we talk about this idea that everything's created twice. You heard, you heard me say it once, you'll hear me say it again, that everything is created twice in, in this world that we experience. It's created first in consciousness and second in form. We work with this thing called the creative process. It ties in with the idea in the, that's talked about in a biblical sense of God's will. God has given us free will so that we can work with a creative process and that that creative process moves through us to express life. It expresses life as you, as me, and everything we see around us. And so as we, we recognize this principle, this perspective that we have about life, I think it's important to recognize that everything I experience comes from yesterday's ideas. And if I like what I'm experiencing, then I'm going to continue to cultivate yesterday's ideas. And if I don't like what I'm experiencing, then it's up to me to begin to shift the beliefs and the ideas that I carry so that I can have a different condition or a different um, experience. And so when we stand in Shiva, and we have this process called the creative process that we're working with, then we are, we are called forth to recognize that whatever the experiences that we're experiencing, whether it be something you're passionate about in the world or something that's happening in your own life, it's temporary. This too shall pass. And so I'm not saying that we shouldn't do anything about it. I'm saying that we should first change our thinking, we should first investigate our beliefs, we should first dive deep into what it is in us that brings forth the experience that we're having, clear that, and then take action in the world. And when we do that, we don't find ourselves making the mistakes that uh, Kali did of just blindly destroying everything. Instead, we're grounded in principle so that we can take action that's based on principles, so that we can, we can des um, destroy, if you will, the ideas in our minds that are not serving us and, and allow ourselves to let go of some of the more uh, illusor illusionary ideas so that we can step into a place of truth. I think the real challenge for many of us comes in the fact that we live in, in a world of instant gratification, or as I like to call it, the drive-through culture, right? You want something, you drive through, they're handed to you through a window, it's yours. <laughs> uh, and I, I haven't had the experience. I have had some instant demonstrations for the work that I've done in this philosophy, where I have, it's been an easy reach, I've shifted my mind about something, and instantly things seem to shift as well. But there are, you know, far by and large, there are things that 
that needs some transformation time within me. The divine is everywhere present. It's never not in everything we experience, but sometimes we need a little stew time <laughs> to, to uh, allow the divine to drop into our experience. I think if we were to experience all the vastness of the one infant reality at one moment, it might just blow up our minds. <laughs> Some of, the, some of the new ideas that have come through for me in my brief time on earth have, have been mind-blowing in and of themselves. And so we need a little time to, to integrate a lot larger idea. And so sometimes the, the, the battles that we rage with life, whether they be our general discontent or uh, whether they be something that's happening in the world that we find outrageous, need the time to move through us to then express that in the world. And so patience is called for. Ernest Holmes writes in the Science of Mind textbook, there is no process of healing, but there is generally a process in healing. This process is the time and effort which we undergo in our real realizations of truth with a capital T. And he also reminds us that spirit is forever taking form and forever deserting the form which it has taken. So that this, this we all know, you know, that the, the, we, we've had, you get to a certain point in life when you've recognized that the, you know, if we look at nature, the, the flowers bloom, they die off, they leave seeds, and that cycle starts again. And we see that in human life as well, that our lives bloom, they come to full flourishing, then we begin to wilt and leave seeds for the next generation. That is the cycle of life. That is, that is truly what Kali represents. She, you know, she came to this, in this initial story I told, she came in and began to destroy everything. But Kali's true uh, nature is the, is the nature of, the nature of nature. I should, could have worded that differently. <laughs> but her, her true, uh, uh, dharma, if you will, the true expression of Kali is that of nature, of creation and destruction that is happening over and over again. And so I think it's ours not to be afraid of destruction. That sometimes there are things that have to be let go of, some things that we have to surrender. And we hold on. I love that saying. It's on a poster somewhere. I'm sure you've heard it. Like, everything I let go of has claw marks on it. <laughs> That's the human condition, especially in our Western culture. <laughs> and sometimes it's just easier to let go. But in order to do that, you have to have some kind of uh, grounding. In order to let go and surrender and trust, you have to have some kind of grounding, some kind of faith and trust. And, and we learn that through, through many of the different religious paths that we talk about here. You can find that faith and trust in Christianity. You can find that in Buddhism, Hinduism. You can find that right here in Centers for Spiritual Living and the Science of Mind philosophy. And then once we're grounded, we have the ability to be in the flow of life as it is created and as it, it goes away. Emma Curtis Hopkins uh, boy, she's, she is the te known as the teacher of teachers. She taught many new thought uh, individuals, enlightened individuals who went on to form different facets of the new thought movement. And uh, she taught Ernest Holmes. She taught uh, Charles and Myrtle F Fillmore, who started Unity. Um, she taught the Nona sisters, who started Divine Science. So she's had a great deal of influence and, um, and, and her writing is just pure principle. And she writes this in her book, The Gospel Series. There is a principle involved in the idea of seeing things as they are. It is possible to look at anything steadfastly enough to see through its imperfection and to see it as good. So she's, 
she's telling us that the circumstances and the conditions and the effects that we see in the world need us to see through them. That oftentimes we have these knee-jerk reactions. I, um, I remember uh, when my s daughter and my son-in-law were uh, selling, uh, th they were buying a condo and it was at the top of the market and I remember being really upset about it because why are they making this, you know, mistake? Why are they doing this? And, and, and I can tell you, you know, 15 years later, it was a mistake. <laughs> 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 but there were so many life lessons that these two learned through making that mistake that, I, you know, I don't know that they would have learned those things or integrated those truths for themselves had they not walked that out. And so, the th and I think I talked about this a little bit last week, right? Like we're always thinking we have to fix everything. And yet there's this grand flow to life that when we learn how to trust it, that everything is in right order. And so when we, um, so I think I, I don't know if I said this already, but when we stand in Shiva or stand in truth, I invite us to do that with a little humility a humility for the power of nature that is moving through all life, the humility that trusts that there's a bigger picture that we can't quite see, a uh, humility that we really trust life to transform itself and always, always that life is, is evolving for the better. And that sometimes it might kind of feel like watching the grass grow but the grass always grows. <laughs> I think I want to wrap up my comments with a, um, a little story uh, about Mahatma Gandhi. It was during one of Gandhi's hunger, hunger strikes that a man whose daughter had been killed came to Gandhi in a state of anguish. He told Gandhi that he would stop fighting because, of course, his hunger strikes were about trying to create instill peace in the land. And so this individual came to Gandhi and said he would stop fighting if Gandhi would end his strike and eat. But Gandhi knew the healing was deeper than just stopping the violence. He knew that there was something that had to happen that was going to be deeper than just dealing with the condition of the day. He told the man he would eat only when the father embraced the man who killed his daughter. The man collapsed in tears. But Gandhi did, but the man did as Gandhi asked, and the larger conflict ended. Gandhi's request reveals this irrefutable wisdom that only when what appears to be broken is reclaimed and honored, no matter what has happened, we will experience healing. And I would add that it comes as a form of revealing. For there is only the perception of disease. There's only the perception of brokenness. Underneath that, there's always wholeness. And our work as uh, spiritual seekers and spiritual finders and practitioners is to be patient and to trust life and the process of life, and then to look at what is ours to do and to take action when we are grounded in principle so that that action can be part of a larger whole and not just the battle that might be raging in front of us. It's quite an invitation, I know, but I also know you're all capable of it. And so that when we Remember to lead with love, love for ourselves, love for humanity. When we remember to do that, everything's possible. Thank you very much. You. And so let's take those big ideas into uh, prayer. 
so I speak this word, this spiritual mind treatment or affirmative prayer, anchored in the power and the presence of the one, the one infinite reality that forever experiences itself as all of life. That thing that makes the grass grow is the same thing that creates the life around me. And so I surrender myself to it, knowing as I speak this word for myself and anyone within the sound of my voice, that there is power. There's power in recognizing and, and honoring the circumstances around us. And there is power in paying attention to how I see it. And there's power in recognizing my part and surrendering what's not mine. And so I know for each one that our seeing is clear, that our heart leads the way, and that our mind, our intentions, our motivations are pure, purified by our spiritual practice, purified by our patience. As we walk forth, doing what is ours to do for our own self, for our families, for our communities, and for the world as a whole. For it does indeed take a village. And so I'm grateful for this village we call Centers for Spiritual Living, Capistrano Valley. And so I anchor this prayer knowing this deep truth for each one. And it is in gratitude that we simply say, and so it is. <laughs>